We are lucky with an amazing topic today about the awliya, the saints of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has drawn close to him, those who he loves, those who have a unique relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll first begin with a quick ayah from the Quran, um, and, then I'll, and, that's, and then I'll read the translation, inshallah, and we'll begin with a breakdown of uh, some of the stories and realities of the saints and those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألا إن أولياء الله لا خوف عليهم لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون الذين آمنوا وكانوا يتقون لهم البشرى في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة لا تبديل لكلمات الله ذلك هو الفوز العظيم صدق الله العظيم This is in Surah Yunus Unquestionably for the allies of Allah there will be no fear concerning them nor will they grieve those who believed and were fearing of Allah. For them are good tidings in the worldly life and in the hereafter. No change is there in the words of Allah. That is the great attainment. So why should we study the awliya? That's okay. Why should we learn about their lives? What is so important about these special people? And in reality, the stories and the belief in the awliya is part of our belief. It's actually a tenet of our faith. And this includes the miracles that they have as well. Karamat al-awliya is part of being a Muslim. And this is something which a lot of people have unfortunately lost touch with. And even Imam Suyuti, you know, uh, hundreds of years ago, mentioned that even in his time, people were rejecting the karamat of awliya, the miracles of the of the awliya. That they didn't believe in it. They kind of, you know, they'd say, "Yeah, I believe in it," but they didn't actually, you know, they kind of. Whenever you would give them a specific instance, they'd say, oh, it "Probably didn't happen." And this has been accentuated by, you know, modern science, the you know, mo new atheism, and the complete attack against anything, you know, uh, metaphysical anything supernatural. So, but in reality, the awliya will remain until the Day of Judgment. There will remain on in the earth one, at least one saint who is a connector, an inter, uh, a predecessor, or sorry, an inheritor of the Prophet Sallallahu Because the Prophet Sallallahu said that the, the awliya are the inheritors of the Prophets. May Allah be pleased with them. And in reality, those who disbelieve in the karamat, the miracles of the prophets, will unfortunately have a hard time when, may Allah protect us, the Dajjal comes. Because the fundamental trick of the Dajjal, the Antichrist, is going to be that he's going to create miracles and do miracles, perform miracles, and then claim that he is God. He's going to bring someone back to life and say, I brought someone back to life, right? I'm, worship me. Um, you guys are, everyone's starving. There's a famine. I'm going to bring you food. So worship me. And without a belief in miracles, like knowing that the natural way that Allah SWT has created the universe, the normal associations that we give things, such as when I when fire burns and whatnot. If we don't believe that those can be broken, 
then when someone breaks it, it's going to shake the faith of, of some Muslims. Some. Right? But those who have a belief in the awliya, who hear their stories, and who have a connection with them, will not be affected. In particular, because they'll gain their protection. They'll gain the protection of uh, the awliya. And all of the stories that I'm going to mention, but also in general, stories of the awliya must be accepted. It's not something that we actually have a choice to reject. And the reason why is because uh, Abu Abdullah al-Mahdi, who is one of the Abbasid Caliphates, he was once sitting with a group of his wazirs, and a man came in and he brought, he had a sandal. And he said, this is the Prophet Wasallam sandal. I'm giving it to you. And the Mahdi, the Khalifa, he took it and he kissed it and he placed it on his forehead and his eyes to gain barakah from the blessed sandal of the Prophet Wasallam. And the man got up and left. And he said, how do I know that that was actually the sandal of the Prophet Wasallam?" And everyone said, you don't. Right? And when the man left, he actually gave him a massive gift of, of like money. And he said that for me to reject his gift and say that's probably not the, the, the sandal of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is worse than for me to have the good opinion that he actually has the sandal of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So knowing that, as we mentioned in, in the ayah of the Quran, that there are saints of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, that there are people who are chosen by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, that accepting their miracles. Right, is safer for us than rejecting them. And of course, this is talking about things that are outside of the pillars of faith. You know, there's no miracle that goes against, for example, praying five times a day. Right, anything like that is falsehood. Right, but everything outside of the fundamental obligations and you know and uh, pillars of faith, these are things that we must accept for our own good. Right, this is why I say, "Sallam amrahum ilayhim." Just constri- you know, const- you know, give them their their right. Don't even question them. Right, because rejecting Allah, the, the awliya of Allah, is very problematic. And there's an ad ali waliyan, faqad adantuhu bil harb. Whoever right, uh, goes against one of my walis, I have sworn him or promised him war. I've waged war against him. Right? So the problem of rejecting or putting down or looking down upon a, a wali of Allah SWT is very. Uh, intense. Now, a lot of times when we talk about the stories of the awliya, we hear just miracle, miracle, miracle. And this person walked on water, this person was flying in the wind, and he came down, right? Like, these are all great. But in reality, it's not the karamat al-suriya that is important, the physical outward miracles that are important. It's the inward miracles, the miracles of understanding, the miracles of drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Out of the 8 billion people, we're all here learning about the awliya. That out of the 8 billion people, or all the Muslims even, we're praying our five prayers. And then on top of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us knowledge. He's giving us divine knowledge. He's increasing our rank. We actually maybe will taste divine love on this path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why... Um, Imam uh, uh, Sheikh Al Hashimi is called the Sheikh of the Shiuch, right? The, the 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 teacher of all the teachers in terms of uh, tasawwuf and spirituality. He was once talking about uh, you know having a class like this, and one of his uh, students said, uh, "You know, we don't see any miracles from you. <laughs> Where are all your miracles?" And he said, "The miracles uh, is is just just being here is the miracle, right?" And um, being a Muslim is a miracle. And the man said, you know, I don't like, he didn't really, that didn't really sit well with him. And he went back home, and the next morning he was consistent on making the prayers in the mosque. On his way to Fajr, he tripped and broke his leg. And he had to go to the hospital, he couldn't go to, you know, he had to walk to the mosque, he couldn't go to the mosque anymore. And then, after he got healed, something else happened. And this man ended up have going an entire year without making it to the mosque. A habit that he considered normal, average. He would make the mosque every day. It was just a habit of his. He wasn't able to even make the mosque, make it to the mosque for an entire year. And he came back to you know, uh, Sheikh al-Hashimi and he apologized. And he said, please forgive me. Because I realized what you were teaching. That the miracle that all of us share in is that we're all here that we're all safe, that Allah SWT has blessed us with Iman, 
and blessed us with love of the awliya, um, and not the, the physical miracles. And in reality, the miracles of istiqama, of uprightness, of continued practice, Islamic practice, are greater because there's no fear for the person of the miracle. Many times, there are some times when an awali will have a miracle, and it will be a test for him. Not only because other, you know, people might be jealous, he might be persecuted, right? A lot of times the awliya were persecuted severely. But also because, right, it might get to his head. You know, someone starts walking on water every day, they think they're special. And it has been, there's another type of, uh, you know, miracle which is called istidraj, which is that it's a, a miracle which is happening to lower the rank of someone, right, to increase him in his folly, to increase him in his, uh, you know, disillusion, um, to increase him in his, uh, you know, make him further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So, the true miracles that have no fear in them are those which uh, are not seen. And in reality, when we look at what is a, a wali, so you know, a lot of times, so, you know, where are all the awliya? Like, where are they? The greatest sign of a wali is adab, is good character. The greatest sign of one of the awliya of Allah is good character. They're full of adab. And this is in every aspect. They have adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their spouses, with their children, with their family, with everyone that they meet, they are an, they're an example of adab. That's the key to the awliya. And there are four states that one might be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One is either, and this is proper adab, is giving the proper state that you're put in is proper due. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are either tested, and in that case, we are patient. We are either blessed with you know health and wealth, and that's when we are uh, grateful. The third state that a human being is in is that he is obedient, and when he's obedient, he witnesses the favor of Allah. That I did nothing to deserve praying today. I did not. There's nothing that I, there's la hawla wa quwwata illa billah. Why was I chosen to say la ilaha illallah today? Right. That's the pure fadl and favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fourth is disobedience. And whenever we are disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah protect us, that's when we are, that's when we show, uh, you know, give repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're either in a state of repentance, gratitude, patience, or, sh or witnessing the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the foundation of good adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why new murids or followers of a shaykh, when they would go and learn with their shaykh, there's actually something called a makhzan, which is like modern Arabic, it's like a dishwasher or like a, a, a sink. Um, and this is where in Morocco, uh, before the murid would go sit with his sheikh, before he'd start benefiting with his sheikh, he'd go sit with the person who would teach him adab. So that he wouldn't come in with all of his rough edges and his craziness. Uh, and disrespect the sheikh or in front of everyone. So it's called the makhzan. It was something that once they came and they learned some basic adab, it's like, okay, now you can go um, and sit with uh, your sheikh. Because a lot of the adab that we consider normal, other people might not uh, you know, deem that the, the, same, the same way. We know the famous story of the Sahabi, the, the Bedouin, who came in and urinated in the Prophet's mosque. Right? So he had a different understanding of, of adab. Right? And the Prophet very gently uh, reminded him. Right? Um, so adab, adab, that's the first sign. The second sign is that his good deeds outweigh his, his bad deeds. I, what you can see of him is that he's someone who is doing more acts of good than outward acts of, of disobedience. And the third thing is that in his speech, he has a deep understanding of Allah. It's an experiential understanding. Okay, so I'm taking, I don't want to get in trouble, but I'm taking a master's program. And there are some uh, professors who talk about tasawwuf. And some of it's good, and some of it you can tell it's a, it's a bit, they're a bit out of their league. I, it's something that they've read a lot of books about, but they haven't actually experienced. So there's a very different, there's a very huge difference between someone who can tell you all the names of Oliya and has read all about them, like me, <laughs> and someone who has experienced the awliya who sat with them and benefited from them and has a deep understanding about what they're talking about right so i can tell you about patience all day long but if you have actually if you're one of patience you're someone who is actually patient 
right? It's going to have a completely different effect. And this is why they say, you know, like, you know, when they talk about who you spend time with, you know, the, the example is spend time with the, you know, the the attar, the person who sells oud. Right? Because when you're spending time with the person who sells sells oud, you uh, you leave smelling good, right? So whoever you spend time with, you're going to be affected by them. And when you spend time with the awliya, you leave with a better connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was once in a setting with, and there was this uh, great sheikh, and he was talking about these amazing uh, realities. And it was just, it felt so good to be in, you know, in that circle. And as soon as we left, it's as if the whole atmosphere changed. <laughs> It's uh, you know, and it was tangible. Everyone, you know, people around were like, "What happened?" Is that when you're with them and you're in their presence, right? You feel different. You feel better. And it's this is why one of the fundamental uh, pillars of drawing closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is good company. This is what transformed the Sahaba. Is that it wasn't just what the Prophet was bringing. It wasn't just the Quran. It was looking at the Prophet's face. It was sitting with him, being with him like like this, right? Being able to sit next to him and hug him, right? And eat with him, right? That's what transformed them, right? That's what made them from the most barbaric of people and very immoral to the greatest, right? The greatest people who have ever lived, right? Who've ever lived after the prophet, uh, after the prophets, sallallahu alaihim, right? So. Many of the uliya are hidden. A lot of them you don't actually, you might, you might never know, right? It's not always the shaykh with the big turban, right? And a lot of the uliya in want to be hidden, right? They don't want to be known. And this was a, um, a famous so, uh, you know, story of uh, Safwan ibn Sulaym. And he was very cautious and, uh, about being known. And he was a major uh, wali and someone who worshipped Allah SWT constantly. He used to pray at night like the Prophet ﷺ until his feet would go sore, just like the Prophet ﷺ at night. And when he would get tired, he'd pray on the roof because it was colder. And, and especially in winter, he'd pray on his roof in winter so that he wouldn't fall asleep. Because when you're in the war, you know, how many of that we had the intention to, you know, stay up late or wake up for tahajjud, and it's so comfortable that you just knock out, right? So, but he would put himself in these very cold, like, environments so that he would, he wouldn't, 100% wouldn't fall asleep. Right? There's another story that one of the, uh, you know, scholars used to, like, sit perched on the top of, um, like, a, a minaret, <laughs> So that when he's reading his books, you know, he could not fall asleep, right? Because, you know, he'd fall. So he was praying once in a mosque, and one of the rulers walked in like this. He walked in the door, and he saw him, and he said, what an amazing abid, a worshiper. And he told one of his servants, he said, go, go send him, um, you know, $10,000, something like that, just a big gift. And... Um, when the man came to him, he said, "No, no, you've got the wrong person, right? You've got the wrong person. I'm not the I'm not the great abbot." He was being humble. So the person, the, you know, the the person with the money was like, "What are you talking about?" So he he went back to his the the khalifa and was like, "I think you got the wrong person." He said, "No, no, 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 no." He just said that. Go back. And when he came back, he was gone. Right. So they have a a, a huge in, intent on not being known, and the reason why is because their focus is Allah. They don't care about what anyone else says about them, whether it's, uh, you know, they said when one reaches the point where the blame of people and their praise is the same, know that they've reached a level of understanding. I, that you're no longer affected whether someone praises you to your face, you're the most amazing person, what an abid, you know, like I've never seen anyone, anyone so amazing. And when someone comes and says, you're a horrible, I hate you, you're despicable, insults you to your face, when it doesn't affect you because your focus is Allah, that's when you know you've reached something significant. Um, and that's why Imam Shibli, radiallahu anhu, he used to say to his murids, or his students, um, and he would have a class every Friday, like today. He said, um, if anything besides Allah passes your mind in this next week, don't come to class. Don't come to class if anything crosses your mind besides Allah. Now that's a very high level. <laughs> like we, we, you know, in class, in the dars, we're thinking about something else. <laughs> but this was where they are at. They're so focused on Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that he said, in an entire week, you can't think about anything other than Allah. Otherwise, don't even show up to class. 
you're not you, you're not ready yet, right? So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala make us uh, among them. And it's part of re you know hearing about them and learning about them that not only inspires in us a a drive to want to be like them and to draw closer to them, but we also make du'a for them and we ask Allah to draw us closer to them and to make us like them, right? To alhiqna bihim, wa alhiqna bissalihin, right? And allow us to catch up with the righteous. This is a du'a in the Qur'an, right? So that, and this is why Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu is narrated to say that, he said, if I wasn't so busy writing fiqh rulings, I would just read the stories of the awliya all day. I would just read them all day, right? And there are major volumes, you know, 10, you know, 10 volumes, uh, tons of books written about the stories of the awliya. Right. So they're hidden, and this is why there are some people, right, that we we might know, and do we think they're normal people, and they act normal, they have normal jobs, nothing special, they're not wearing a turban or kufi, nothing, and all night they're praying, right. and all night they're focusing on Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They're in deep contemplation with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They're calling on Him. They're pleading with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala every night. And the rest of the day, you have no idea. You're like, you're just average guy. That's just uncle so-and-so. And he's a wali. Right? And this is why, because as we mentioned, the, the special miracles are those that are hidden, we always have to have a good opinion of, the, of, of every Muslim. Because we don't know who you're dealing with. Right? You, do, you can never look down on anyone or push anyone down because you don't, that person could be a wali. Right? And there are many cases where there are people who even, right, in order to hide their status as a wali, would do things that would make them look kind of silly or like, uh, kind of like, uh, would, you know, like in the past it was like look down on to eat on this in the eat in the street, right, or to like ride on a donkey backwards, considered like very, uh, like aib. <laughs> they would do that on purpose so that people say, oh look at that backward donkey rider, right? And he's a straight welly, right? Now. A lot of times, a lot, there are some people like Imam Nawi uh, who they're born and they're just immediately taking into Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's care. Right? He's five, he's and he's you know studying, and the kids or at that young age come up to him and say, "Let's go play soccer. Let's go. Let's go play." And he's like, "I I, I wasn't created to play games, right?" At at a young age, and for, for others that happened later on in their life, for others that happened after a major experience, a major loss. Right, there was once a, a grave robber. It was very common in the past, right? Not anymore. A grave robber. They used to go and just rob graves, and he attended. <laughs> he attended the Janaza prayer of a woman to know where the grave was to rob her that night. So he attended the Janaza prayer and he prayed. That night he went back to the grave and he dug the grave, and as soon as he reached her kefen, her her wraps, she spoke to him and said. Subhanallah, right? how is it that someone who is forgiven is trying to steal from someone else who is forgiven? Right? She said that anyone who prayed my janazah, and we know that the janazah prayer is a way to, get, to gain forgiveness from Allah SWT. She said anyone who prayed on me yesterday uh, was completely forgiven their sins. So how is someone who is completely forgiven trying to steal from someone who is completely forgiven? And this struck him and he immediately then changed his life. There's also, there's also the story of, you know, Bishr al-Hafi, radiallahu anhu, a major uh, wali of our tradition. And he was, uh, you know, kind of in lahu and a lot of just, you know, not very practicing, involved in the wrong things. And he was walking once and he saw a little piece of uh, paper. And on it was written Allah SWT's Allah name, Allah, on the paper, on the dirt, just like covered in dirt. So he's... He was struck by that and he had at least the adab. He came and he picked up the piece of paper and he dusted it off. And he brought it back to his house and he purchased with his last bit of money some oud. And he uh, oiled the, you know, put, you know, perfumed the, the piece of paper and he put it on his wall. Right? And that night when he went to bed, Allah SWT told him in his dream, or he heard a voice that said, You purified our name. So we will purify your name in this world and the next. Right? So that one action, Allah SWT changed his entire reality. And the uh, uh, awliya are those, as we mentioned in the beginning, are chosen by Allah. It's not something that we can do that gains it. None of us are going to start praying 20 rakahs and 
we're going to be, uh, that's, that's the reason why we're going to be uh, a wali. Allah SWT chooses whoever He wants. And some of the people we mentioned earlier, Allah SWT chooses to be His servants. Uh, he chooses for them just to worship Him all day and a night. They're just there to worship Allah. And there are some servants that He chooses to love, right? That they gain the love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So it's chosen. It's istifa, and and um, um, but you put in the means, right? And you try your best to draw closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Allah will open the door. I'll, I'll repeat this. It was in the khutbah. Um, it may be the Prophet said. It may be that the door that is constantly knocked opens up. I.e. that with effort and trying your best, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala opens the door for you, and He gives you. Right, the the secrets of this world and the next. May Allah Allahumma iftah alayna futuh al arifin. That's an amazing dua we should say. Oh Allah, give us the openings of the arifin. Give us their openings. We don't want our openings. We want their openings of the arifin. Those who know Allah, we want the openings that they're getting after they knew Allah. That's what we want. Allahumma iftah alayna futuh al arifin. Allah and the Sufis, they or the the, the awliya, they de they debated about whether or not it was better. This is in their books to be poor and patient, or rich, right and grateful, right. So you are you know and thankful. You're rich and you give a lot and you're thankful to Allah, or is it better to be poor and not have anything and then just be patient, patient? And in reality, after you know many discussions. The reality is that in whatever situation Allah Subhanahu wa Taala places us, that is, we 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 act in it accordingly, as we mentioned earlier. When Allah Subhanahu wa Taala blesses us with wealth, we are thankful, and when He bless and He, and he, and when he takes uh, from us, we are patient. Um, and the key is that, and this is you know we talk about a, like a key factor of what a saint is is that he's a zahid, he's someone who detached himself from the dunya. And we usually think that, and we hear stories like, you know, Imam, you know, Ibn Arabi, you know, living off of like, uh, like an almond for an entire month, and that was one of his uh, miracles, right? But or and these people who would, you know, leave everything and walk in, you know, and, and just wear the worst of clothing, and look the poorest of people, that was their zuhud. But in reality, real zuhud is a state of the heart. And we'll see this in a, in, a, in, a, in a story later on. Real zuhud is a state of the heart. It's not about what you're wearing or who you're with. It's about what your heart is attached to. And there's, there's a story of a man. He was with one of these zahids. Um, and this was a very righteous man. And he would pray to Allah SWT long hours. And he would go hunt his own food. So he would go and he would fish. And he'd bring back whatever he'd bring back. He'd give half of it away in charity, and the other half he'd eat. So very you know, standard zahid, right? Ascetic. And uh, he had a student, and the student learned from him and benefited from him. And um, they heard that one of his shiuch in other story, in other narrations, it mentioned the Imam Al Rifari or Abdul Qadir Al Jailani. Ibn Ajiba doesn't mention that. But he says that there's a sheikh who, who who's coming to town, basically. And he said, so the sheikh. He said to his student, "Go visit my sheikh. Right? This is my. I love this sheikh. He's my sheikh. Go visit." Him. So he goes and he travels. You know, another another city, whatnot. Travels, gets there, and he shows up at the address, and it's a castle. He's like, it "Can't be right. This can't be right. <laughs> How? Why is this a castle?" And um, he's looking, and he asks one of the guards, "Is this the, the place of the this wali?" He says, "Yeah, this is the place of the wali." He's like, "Ajib, what's going on?" So he waits and he waits in the, in the courtyard, and then the king comes, and the king is covered in the fanciest of robes, and um, uh, <laughs> he's like you know, riding on a horse or in a carriage. And the man says, you know, forget this. I'm not even going to go give him salams. <laughs> he's like, this person is not a zahid. <laughs> but he said, I have to listen to my sheikh. I have to at least obey his orders. So he goes, and he, not, and he goes to the sheikh, and he gives his salams, and he said, so and so gives his salams. And the sheikh says, tell him, right, to 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 stop being so attached to the dunya. That sheikh who is covered in the robes tells the, the, the student, tell him to stop being so attached to the dunya. Tell him to you know, you know, disconnect his heart from the dunya. And um, he's, you know, in one narration they say he fainted, but he basically is so shocked. 
he's you know he's angry. He gets up and he just leaves. Goes back to his sheikh and he says, you know, sheikh, you know, I visited the sheikh. I visited your sheikh, and the sheikh said, what did he tell you? He said, oh, you know, nothing. He's trying to just hide it. You know, he said, no, 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 no. Tell me what he told you. And he said, he told him what he told him. And he said, Subhanallah, you know, how connected am I to the dunya? Um, and I'm in this state. And there's another narration that said that he used to, all he had was a pair of old um, abqab. They're like these wooden slippers. Like in a, So they used to have slippers completely made out of wood. They're not comfortable, right? And that's all he had. But he was so, or maybe in some, in some areas, there was like the like a, a, a pot that he used to, to, to use the restroom. And um, he said that he would place it in front of, on the side of him in his house so that when he was praying, someone wouldn't come and steal it, right? So he, even though he was in the state of complete zuhr asceticism, he was still connected in his prayer to these, to this, you know, pair of slippers. And the other sheikh, right, was in the big, the, the fanciest of luxury and castles, and he wanted nothing to do with it. His heart was disconnected from it, and Allah placed him in that position for uh, for wisdom. And this is why, you know, if it is Abdul uh, Abdul Qadir Al Jailani, he used to have almost ten thousand murids with him, and he'd feed them every day. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala blessed him with wealth and order to benefit the ummah and to serve people and to feed them and to give them a place to stay. Right? The same thing with Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu, he was very fortunate, he was very wealthy. Right? And he was a uh, zahid, he was known for his zuhud. Right? But he used that money to, to support his students, to support uh, Abu Yusuf radiallahu anhu, who was his, his uh, top student. Right? So it's about what the heart is connected with too, not the outward appearance of anyone. And the next point I want to mention about the awliya is that all of the sahaba are awliya. Every single sahabi and sahabiya, whether it's even a child, even Imam Suyuti, he went far as to say that even a young child who was a sahabi was a mujtahid. I, that child was able to create their own madhab. Right? Even a child right, because of their connection with the Prophet, has the knowledge to create their own madhab. It's an opinion. But it's guaranteed and agreed upon that all of these sahabas, even the children, are uliya, saints, guaranteed. They're the best of us. They're the best nation after the Prophets. May Allah be pleased with them. And we see this in many stories of the sahaba. I don't want to talk too long about the stories of the sahaba. We'd be here all night. But one story in particular is Um Sulaim. She was married to Abu Talha, and they had a son. And Abu Talha, radiallahu anhu, they were both sahabas, he loved his son. And he went out with the Messenger of Allah right, to do something, an errand or something, or maybe, maybe it was a prayer. And while he was gone, his son passed away. His son was sick and passed away. Um, so he came back after a long time to his house. And we can imagine the situation we'd be in 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 in, our, in, in Um Sulaim's situation. We put ourselves in her in her in her footsteps, uh, in, her, in her place. You know, a lot of people would immediately rush with the news, right? You know, freaking out, right? Obviously, it's our own, it's our child, it's our child, right? Um, but in order, right, to to not immediately abruptly give him the news as soon as he walked in the door. She wrapped him in the the, the garments of, uh, of the funeral, and she bathed him, and she and did everything she had to do, and she placed him on his bed. And when her husband walked in, he said, "Where is our son?" And she said, "He's re he's resting." And she had um, she had uh, prepared food for him, and he ate, and they had a, and they talked, and they had a conversation. And this entire time, her son, his son had had passed away. It, because she didn't want to, and this, this is why they, they said the secret of the awliya is jabrul khatir, is making, fe making people feel better, right? is fixing people's uh, in, emotional state, right? making them feel better, giving them, uh, you know, con uh, consoling them, giving them comfort in their situations. That's the secret of the awliya. So she didn't rush, with, rush to him with the news. And the next morning she told him, she said, if someone were to give someone, uh, to, to let someone borrow something, 
and they came back to him and said, I want it. Do they have a right to do so? And she said, and he said, absolutely. She said, then know that your Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is in more, who has more of a right over anyone else, has taken away your son that you that he let you borrow. Right? All right, so go bury your son. And he went and he told the, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and the Messenger of Allah praised her and said that there will come from you great khair, great good. And she then would later have a, another son, Abu, uh, Abdullah ibn Abi Talha, um, major tabi'i. And from them they had 10 children. All of them were students uh, and, and masters of the Quran, scholars of the Quran. And they were blessed from this from the patience that she showed, right? From the, uh, per, you know, the absolute, uh, you know, perseverance and control, right? And this is why there's another story of a Sahabi, a Sahabiya who was at the grave of, a, uh, and this kind of highlights the idea. She was at the grave of a deceased one, and the Prophet was passed by, and she said, and he said, "Be patient, be patient." And she didn't know it was the Prophet, and she said, "Go away from me, get away from me." And so when one of the Sahabas came by, he said, you, did you know that was the, the Messenger of Allah? Right? She was immediately, uh, you know, she felt so horrible. She rushed to the Prophet and said, oh, Messenger of Allah, I didn't know it was you. And he said, as-sabru in the sadamat al-ula. Patience is, on, is at the first blow. Patience is when, it, you know, when, when, when life hits you the hardest, when it's the most difficult, that's when patience matter. So Um Sulaim, this type of patience is only show, it can only be found in the awliya. You will not find a level of patience at the at this height at this height of patience. And she didn't have to do be do that. You know, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not saying that this is how we have to act. That's not the point of the story. Right? Of course, may Allah not uh, afflict us, but if if any of us were tried with uh, the loss of our children, right, you know, uh, if we were to immediately tell our spouse, that would be totally fine, right? But this is just something that she did, worrying about, right, the way that he would, he would, he would uh, respond, right? Worrying about her, like breaking him down after a long day, and he just came with the message from the Messenger of Allah, so that the first thing that he that he heard when he entered the door would be that your son that you love so much passed away, and and just root and break him, right? So she was patient with him, she treated him well. And then she broke the news to him in the most amazing of manners. Right. Now, the second um, reality is that not only were the Sahabas Oriyat, but also the four Imams. So a lot of the Tabirin, right, you could say, but the four Imams are also Oriyat. This is very important, right? Because a lot of people, you know, say you know things about Abu Hanifa or whatnot, they'll criticize him. All of the all of the four imams are awliya. Every single one of them are are are, are close and dear to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and this is because he made their standard, i.e., what they came, what they concluded with, as the standard Islam for millions or billions of Muslims throughout time. I the way that a lot of us here, probably Hanafis, practice Islam, right? A majority of the world is probably Hanafi. A majority of them, and throughout time followed Abu Hanifa. Right? They followed his conclusions about what the Prophet ﷺ brought in the Quran. Right? So all of them are saints. So this is agreed upon. This is ijma. It's just it's completely there's consensus on this. So about a story about the Imams, Imam Ahmed radiallahu anhu, he was the student of Imam Shafi'i. Imam Ahmed, the student of Imam Shafi'i. And he used to tell his daughter about Imam Shafi'i, he tell him, he tell her about all of the amazing miracles and stories of Imam Shafi'i. You know, he, he was his his teacher, his everything. And he said Imam Shafi'i is going to visit us, and she was so excited to see the great Imam Shafi'i. When Imam Shafi'i came, he visited and he ate a lot of food. Right, he ate his full. And his daughter, you know, she, I mean, she's the daughter of Imam Ahmed, so she's very. To, you know, in tune. She knows exactly what she's looking for. And she said, okay. Then he went to bed right away after Aisha. Didn't stay up and pray and whatnot, as he was known to do, right? They said Abu Hanifa for 40 years or 30 years prayed Fajr with the same wudu as Isha. For 30 years, right? He prayed Fajr with the same wudu as Isha. All night he was in ibadah and worship. Right. Another story, I love Imam Abu Hanifa. Another story was Abu Hanifa, 
was um you know this man used to uh you know it, from his room he could see you know some of the building and then he saw this pillar on the top of one of the buildings and he just it was just a pole you know randomly one day you know um he walks outside and this every morning when he'd wake up he'd see the he'd see the pole every night when he'd go to bed he'd see the pole he woke up one day he didn't see the pole and he we went outside. He said, "Wasn't there like a pull up there? What happened?" They said, "Abu Hanifa passed away today." Right? That he was he was standing pray, in pray, in prayer for so long that this person lived his life thinking that there was a pole on his roof, which was Abu Hanifa praying. So, um, back to uh, Imam Ahmed. So Abu, uh, Imam Shafi comes in. He eats a lot, and then he sleeps right away. And then he wakes up and, and he prays Fajr without wudu. He goes and prays with them. Maybe he leads the prayer. And he prays without wudu. So um, the daughter came to Imam Ahmed and said, I don't know about your sheikh. No, she, said, she said, I've seen, you've, you talked, you've talked so, so many, about so many good things about him, but I've seen these things that bothered me. So she told him what happened. And he said, "Okay, I'll, I'll do some investigation. I'll go ask him." So she went to. So he went. Imam Ahmed went to Imam Shafi'i, and he asked him. And he said, "These are three things we saw. Could you maybe give some clarification?" And Imam Shafi'i he said, "You are of the righteous. You are of the salihin." And he said that the food of the righteous is medicine, while the food of the evil is poison. Right, and this is a secret. Right, a secret of the oliya is that. They ate together. There is a secret in the transmission of secrets through eating. This is why in Mauritania, I was in Mauritania for two years. It's the custom that the, the great Sheikh, you know, Murad al Hajj, he would drink milk and then pass it around. Uh, there's barakah in sharing from the same food of the awliya. And the Prophet, he shared his food with his companions. He fed his companions. They would share the bowl, the same bowl. Right? So it's a sunnah. And there's a secret, and there's a secret involved in that as well. And pass in terms of passing on, right, the inheritance of, of uh, wisdom and, and, and knowledge. So, he said that the the food of the salihin is medicine. So I ate a lot of it, and he said, um, I lay down and as soon to, to rest after eating, and as soon as I lay down, I saw the entire Quran and the Hadith open up in front of me. I, it was there, present for me. And he said that in this night, I came, I figured out 72 beneficial rulings in fiqh in this night. Like while he was laying down, he figured out by looking in his dream, or not in his dream state, in his awakened state, but with his eyes closed, he figured out 72 new ahkam right, in that night. And because of that, he had not sleep, slept, and that's why he prayed without wudu. And then he told Imam Ahmed the, the, those rulings, right? Um, and, they, and these were new rulings that he had come to conclusions about. Right? So um, all of the four Imams are awliya. And one of the people at the, who lived at the time, Imam Shafi'i, was Rabi al Adawiyya. She is considered the master of mystic love, right? And so much so that there's like a whole philosophy of love, of spiritual love, based off of her teachings. Right? And the Egyptians go crazy for it, <laughs> for Rabia. She lived at the time of Imam Shafi'i. And she was known for her, uh, her righteousness and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She was born into a very poor family. And at a very young age, she was made an orphan. And she said that, when I lost my parents, Allah opened the door for me. Because I realized that all I had was Allah. He was the only one left for me. And she used to say, I don't, love you, O oh Allah, out of fear or out of personal benefit, personal gain. Right? I love you too, love. So, I love you out of pure desire. I have pure, uh, pure desire for you. Right? Because you're the most tremendous. You're Allah. You're the most tremendous Lord. And I love you with just pure desire. I don't want anything in, uh, in, in, in return for it. And because you deserve to be loved. And because you deserve to be loved, right? So her love was pure. A lot of our relationship with Allah SWT is fundamented off of what we gain from it, right? When times are good, we're happy with Allah SWT. Oh, Alhamdulillah, shukur, you know, Allah is so good to me. 
Ya Allah, thank you so much. You add a couple of rakahs at night. And then as soon as you lose your job, right, there's bad adab with Allah, right? Oh man, why, why is this happening? Uh, you start complaining. You might lose, one of us might lose focus in their prayer. They're so, like, you know, they lose hope. Right? They start to, they're like, qalaq, they start to like freak out, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there for us, right? And our love is fundamental off of who He is. Not because he's given us things, right? They said, "My min na'ima, inna li araka." I don't want paradise for the pleasures of paradise. The only reason I want paradise is to see you, is to see Allah. This is one of what the saints used to say. So, um, she was once praying. She used to pray uh, long hours, and a thief came to rob her uh, in the middle of the night. He broke into her house, and he didn't find anything to, to steal, right? He found nothing to steal. So he kind of just, I'm going to leave, because like, there's nothing here, right? It's a bad house. She said, don't leave empty-handed, right? Pray two rakahs. So at least you benefited, right? and you didn't leave empty-handed. And as, she, as he began, he said, okay, fine. <laughs> so, so he started to pray his two rakahs, and she made dua for him. And he ended up praying the entire night with him, with her. Uh, not, well, not with her, but he prayed in, in, in her house the entire night in ibadah. He went from a thief to someone who, who, who would spend the entire night focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is actually, you know, if any of us have tried to pray all night, very difficult. Right? I haven't done it. It's very hard, right? Just to stand there all night and pray. So he went from this thief to someone who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed with that tremendous ability to worship him. Right? And this was the effect that she had, as we mentioned, right? The effect that the awliya have on those around them with one interaction, right? And she would tell herself, because she would pray all night, um, oh how long you have slept. And she would talk to her eyes. Oh how long you have slept, right? And you have no idea how long you'll live, right? So this might be your last night, right? So don't sleep, so don't sleep another night, right? And she would tell this to herself every night, and she'd stay up all night. Now, these are miracles, okay? So, so don't try and stay up all night tonight praying, right? Um, the Prophet says that the best of actions are those that are consistent, even if it's small, right? So we start small, we worship Allah, at our capacity, with a, a lofty intention to keep trying to get better, to keep working, and then Allah SWT will open us the doors. But the, but the ability to pray all night is not a normal human ability. It takes an opening from Allah SWT, and, uh, and that's what these people are doing. right? So that's just a quick caveat, because I was one time reading uh, a book about Imam Ghazali and he was talking about you know sleep and how the uliya wouldn't sleep and whatnot and I tried it for a couple weeks and I got very sick don't try that right you'll, you'll, you'll hurt yourself trying to stay up uh, you know on very low sleep we'll do questions afterwards so they the uliya saw every day as their final day we you know you say pray as if this is your last. They saw that as in every moment that was their last. That's why they said that Omar radiallahu anhu, or I might mix up the names, but Omar radiallahu anhu said, "I don't look to the night, right? I don't guarantee myself the the evening when I'm in the morning." Or this is maybe even Omar. He'd say, "I wouldn't. I don't look to the night to the night when I'm in the morning. I I I don't assume that I'm going to live to that uh, to the to the evening. I don't put off anything else to the evening, and when I'm in the night, I don't put off anything else to the morning. I don't look towards the morning. And Abu Bakr said, I don't, I don't wait for the next breath. Every breath, every exhale, I don't expect an inhale. Every inhale, I don't expect, expect the exhale. That's how focused he was in being in the moment. As a, the, they said that the wari is ibn waqtihi. Right? The one who is on his time, I, in every moment, he is focused, right? He is locked in. <laughs> he is completely giving that second its due. That second is due. So in order to kind of um, conclude uh, about one, I know we talked about a couple different, I want to talk about one of the 
greatest awliya in our tradition, Abu Hassan al-Shadili radiallahu anhu, passed away in 1258 Hijri. Just so that we have one figure that we leave with, um, who is very significant and very important in this tradition of awliya. Very important, right? Qutb al-Ghawth, right? The master, the pole, the one who is, you know, relied upon on, in all of our so if it returns to Abu Hassan al-Shadili, some say. So he, will, he was from Morocco, and as a young man, he's traveled to study the traditional sciences, and uh, he went from to Iraq to Tunis, and he spent a lot of time with Abu al-Fatih al-Wasiti, another major uh, uh, wali and an alim. And Abu al-Fatih, he said, "You're searching for the Qutb." So the Qutb is someone who is like the the master saint, the master wali in the world. Right? There's only one. He's the he's the one at that time who is in charge of. Uh, he has the complete inheritance of the Prophet So he's taking, uh, you know, he's in charge of all spiritual states, right? Um, that's called the Qutb. So he said, you're searching for the Qutb in Tunis, uh, and the Qutb is in your country, right? So he goes back and he finds uh, Abdul Salam ibn Mashish. He lived on the top of a mountain in Morocco. You can visit his maqam, right? Very, very uh, tall, you know, mountain to get up there. And um, he, before he went up to the mountain, or some say he went up and then came back down, but he, you know, completely took off all of his clothes, uh, his his you know, nice robes and garments, and put on the old robes, the the, the the dirty rags of those who are poor, and he removed his entire uh, state, right, his entire uh, name and and and, uh, and knowledge and prestige. And when he came up um, to the to the mountain, Abdul Salam met him by saying, "You're Abdul Abu Hassan, son of so and so and so and so and so." Until he reached the Prophet, so he never met him, but he told him his lineage until the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Hassan Ashadli right, was was related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he said, "You came to us poor or stripped of your knowledge and your works and your actions, so you will leave with the riches of this world and the next." Right. So this is a fundamental pillar of of tasawwuf of drawing closer to Allah you cannot move forward if you've already if you think you've already reached the the, the the end point right you can't take any steps further if you think that you are have reached a certain maqam a certain status status or rank with Allah right so the abd no matter how high he gets he is always making toba he's always asking Allah for forgiveness he always sees himself in naqs in deficiency and that's what the prophet he said indeed I uh, make Tawbah, repentance to Allah, 70 times a day. The Prophet ﷺ didn't have any sins. He never committed a sin, Wasallam. Why is he making Tawbah? Because every single moment was an increase, and every single act of worship that he did and he draw closer to Allah, he saw the previous state that he was in as deficient. And he would make a Tawbah for the previous state of perfection that he was in. Because there's no limit to perfection. They say perfection accepts perfection, right? That's like a, a principle, right? So in every moment that he would increase to Allah, he'd see the previous state as complete heedlessness or, or deficiency. And then he would make a tawbah, and Allah would then raise his rank even higher, right? So there's a secret in, in, in completely stripping yourself of your knowledge and your, and your, and your actions when, when drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he came in, uh, and they said one day, you know, he started to study with him and learn from him and take this deep experiential knowledge. And he said that he one time walked in um, to Abdul Salam al Mashish, radiallahu anhu. And in his mind, he had the intent to ask him about Ismullah al A'zam. This is a hadith mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the greatest, the, the greatest name. And whoever, or he has 99 names, whoever counts them, it enters into paradise. And he has the greatest name that whenever is asked by, they're given. Whenever one calls by this great name of Allah, their, their dua is immediately answered. Right? This is in our tradition, in the, in the hadith. So he came in thinking, I'm going to ask the shaykh about Allah's greatest name, Ismullah al-A'lam. And um, Abu Salam al-Mashish, his son, young son, three years old, or just at the uh, the age of being able to speak, he stood up and slapped Abu Hassan in the chest, right? 
He hit him in the chest and said, right, what's wrong with you, right? Why are you asking about Allah's greatest name? You have to become Allah's greatest name. You have to become, i.e., you have to embody the attributes, right, that, that Allah SWT will then accept your dua because, because you've reached such a level of perfection. You have to reach the state of complete uh, drowning in the divine presence and understanding of and reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine names that you are the Ismullah Ismul al-Azam. You're Allah's greatest name. And the shaykh smiled and said, the child has answered you. Right? The child has answered your question. Radiallahu anhum. So, um, um, now when one reaches that state, state of connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is where that, the rest of the hadith says, Right, um, Allah. No, no one draws closer to Allah, you know, with or is more beloved to Allah than the obligatory acts. And then the slave will continue to draw closer to Allah with, uh, you know, um, extra acts, nawafil, until I love Him. And when I love Him, I am His hearing, His sight, His hands, His feet. I am His everything. I, the servant, becomes. Right, the complete reflection of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's divine names, right, and that is the goal, right, of the people of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and this is why it's, it's, uh, children actually have a high, very high receptivity to, uh, to these, to the spirituality, to understanding actually, right, because they're so pure, right? they're born with such uh, purity that uh, the these understandings come very easy to them at a young age and then through ghafla and through the corruption of their uh, circumstances and their parents right then they they lose that ability okay. um so uh, abdul salam and mashish completed his studies with him and then he told him go travel and 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 you'll travel throughout the lands and learn from this person and this person and he actually told him all of the different places that he will travel to he said you'll go here and then you go here, and then you go here. I, you'll, you know, this is how you'll complete your studies. He told me exactly where to go. And he, uh, the next stop was Tunis. So Abu, uh, Abu Hassan al-Shadili, he came to Tunis. And when he got there, right, um, before he entered the city, he asked permission right, from the awliya in the city, from the saints in the city. And he waited outside the city, and he, and he asked permission. And Abu al-Fatih al-Wasili, the one who we mentioned earlier, the one who gave him advice to go back and find the Qutub in Morocco was in that city, and he said at that in that that day, this is a this is a turban that does not fit two heads, i.e. the state the status of 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 wilaya of sainthood right is not for is not shared right at this highest level, and that same night he passed away, and Abu Hassan al-Shadli entered into the into the into the city. Right, and this is why it's very important. That every city has is protected by the awliya. It's a, it's the protection of the countries of the city is the awliya themselves. This is why whenever we're traveling or going somewhere, we should always the, the tradition is to read seven uh, ayatul kursi um, for the awliya in that land. Right, and um, one of the, someone in in you know when studying this doubted this. They doubt they like you know there's not a wali everywhere. Right, um, they're not in every city. So he had they had doubt in this, and as they left the the majlis of the sheikh, they're driving, and you know driving normally they're pulled over by a cop. They're pulled over by a cop, and um, they're like, what did I do? I, I can't I can't be dealing with this right now. I can't get pulled over right now. So he pulls over. The cop rolls down the windows, and he said, "Right in every in every city, right they're protecting you. In every city, they're protecting you. Now go on your way, right? So even you know, even uh, those who you you know you might not the the, the least expecting people, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala can place wilaya with them. So Abu Hassan al Shadili, you know, before he gained his complete opening, he was once studying or with his um, one of his friends. They went to a cave to go study and worship Allah. This was a practice that the Prophet used to do, right? He would used to go right and do khalwa, you know, forty days at a time in Hira, right? And that's when he was then given his opening, right? Jibril came to him and. That's where we. That's where the revelation began. So the Oliya did this, right? They'd go make khalwa, they'd go to a cave, and they'd worship Allah. All they would do is worship Allah all day, and they'd have tremendous openings. So they 
he went and they'd go and they'd worship Allah and they'd say, tomorrow Allah will open the, open the door for us. Every night they'd say that. And as they were eating food one day, a man walked in and they could tell by the way he walked in that he was someone special. And he said, they said, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? And he said, how is the one who keeps saying, tomorrow Allah will open for me? Right? Worship Allah for Allah. Stop worshiping Allah for an opening. Worship Allah for Allah. And the next morning they had their, they, Allah SWT opened the doors for them, right? So these, the awliya is really important. We learn a lot about these openings. We don't worship Allah for these openings. Our, our intent of praying is not that Allah opens us and we start doing miracles and we have this status and we're, oh, maybe even no one knows us, but we're of the awliya. Not the point. You worship Allah for Allah and He chooses whoever He wills. You are til hikmata mayyasha. He gives wisdom, divine wisdom, to whoever he wills. And whoever has been given wisdom has been given tremendous good, a tremendous blessing. So may Allah give us khair. May Allah give us tawfiq, inshallah. Um, there's a, a funny thing about Imam Shadili. Um, the traditional understanding is that he was actually born in a city called Shadili or Shadil, that's where he was born and that's why he's called Abu Hassan al-Shadili they usually call the, they call the people by the, their town you'd be ascribed to where you're from we don't do this now, but it's, that's what they used to do in the past but there's another opinion about his name that he once asked Allah why did you call me Shadili? and Allah SWT, he heard a voice saying I didn't call you Shadili I called you Shad Li, which means, I, 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 Shad means like singled out, specific. You have been singled out for me. Li means me. So I called you Shad Li. I singled out for me, and people call you Shad Li. He's been singled out by Allah for divine uh, love. And he used to say, I didn't, I don't, he didn't write any books, Imam Hassan Shad Li. Other scholars wrote books. He wrote no books. And he used to say, I don't write books. My books are my companions, right? And this is like the this is one of his inherit uh, inheritances from the Prophet uh, because the Prophet didn't write any books, right? The Prophet couldn't read or write, but he wrote men, right? He wrote his companions, men and women, who took his secrets and then passed it on throughout the generations. So Abu Hassan al in the same way, he didn't write any books, but his students then carried the secrets right until our time now. Um, and Abu Hassan al-Shadi is actually unique, as we mentioned earlier, kind of these like, understandings of what a Sufi is and Zuhud. He used to love wearing nice clothing. He, he did not wear you know, rough clothing. He used to dress in very nice thobes. He used to wear a very nice oud. Right? So it's, it, the Prophet used to love oud as well. Right? So it's a sunnah to love oud. He used to eat good food. And he used to ride a horse wherever he'd go. He'd ride a horse. Right? So he was like a king. And the, you know the Moroccans they used to they, they they carry these white flags for the awliya, right? It's kind of like a whole procession, and they're they're doing drums. It's like a very you know um, amazing experience to witness, right? You're like an awali is walking down. And Allahu alam, you know. But that's how they used to do it now. Anyway, so he said he used to say, right? Know Allah, love Allah, and be as you are. Right? Love Allah and know Allah, gain knowledge of Allah, and then dress however you want. Right? I.e., be dressed poorly, dress richly, drink, eat and drink whatever you want, but love Allah and have a connection with Allah. That's what matters. Not that you're drinking, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, very like r bitter things or wearing rough clothing. And he said that, you know, he used to recite the ayah, man harrama zinatallahi allati akhraj li ibadih. Say who, who, who prevented the, the beauty of Allah that he, uh, that he made uh, prevalent to his, his, his servants, right? And he used to say, barrid al ma, right? Make cold the water. When you drink water, make it cold, right? And heat up the tea so that when you drink the water, you give a complete shukr to Allah. Your shukr is complete. Right? The shukr you're going to give when you drink cold water, and we've all experienced this on a hot day, it's, it's very hot <laughs> right now. So when you drink cold water on these days, imagine the shukr you give as opposed to, you know, you're crushing your nafs drinking hot, hot water, right? Which some of the Zahid used to do, they drink like warm water to kind of knock down their nafs. He would say, barrid al ma, right? Make cold the water, right? And heat up the tea so that when you give that shukr, it is with the bottom of your heart.
right? You, you enjoy every sip of it, right? It fills your entire chest with coolness and love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once he was talking, this is kind of similar to one of the stories I mentioned, he was once talking in a majlis like this, and uh, he was wearing one of his nice clothing, and one of the, the people in the, in the audience um, used to, and this is, this is a, a good lesson, be careful what you think around the awliya, right? Be careful what you think about the awliya, because they, they, they know your thoughts. So he was sitting, and uh, one of his students was dressed in very, you know, kind of ragged, and he looked like one of the fuqara, the poor. And he said, how, you know, this person is talking about zuhd. Abu Hassan al-Shadi was talking about being a zahid and being ascetic. He's like, he's talking about disconnecting from the dunya and he's wearing nice thobes. He thought this. He didn't say this to the shaykh. Abu Hassan in the middle of his desk lesson turned to him. He said, Ya hadha. Right? Oh, you. Right? You wear rough and poor clothes so that people think that you're poor. So that people think that you're a zahid. And we wear rich clothes because we don't need anyone but Allah. I, our clothes call with the tongue of, 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 of rich in Allah. I, we don't need anything else from anyone. Allah has made us rich and we're rich with Him. And your clothes are calling to everyone else to say, Oh, look at this miskeen. Look at this poor person. Look at this person who is so you know, uh, disconnected from the dunya. He's so focused on Allah. Right, so it's about it's about your connection part. Right, Abu Abbas al Mursi was his Khalifa, his you know the person who came after his inheritor, and Abu Abbas al Mursi was one of his students. They traveled throughout Morocco and all over the place. They traveled together, and he he learned from his Sheikh. And there was once a dars, and this is after Abu, uh, Abu Abbas al Mursi had kind of taken the inheritance from Abu Hassan al-Shadli. Abu Hassan al-Shadli knew that he was going to be his inheritor. Right? They know exactly who they're going to give the inheritance to. So there was once a dars, and Abu Hassan al-Jazidi, different, different uh, scholar, was sitting, and during the dars he saw a man sitting close, like kind of in the back, or like over there, for example. And he said, you know, who's that man? I've never seen this man before. And he asked one of the, the other attendees, and the person said, who are you talking about? So he kept quiet. He's like, this person doesn't see him. After the lesson, he goes up to Abu Hassan al-Shadli, and he, Abu Hassan al-Shadli says, that's Abu Abbas and Mursi. Right? They were in Alexandria, it was like a three-hour drive from Cairo. Back then, you know, it took a lot longer. Right? Every night, he said Abu Abbas would come and attend his dars in the realm of spirits. Right? He would come and attend his dars, listen to it, and then go back to whatever he was doing. Right? Wherever he had been positioned right, to give da'wah and to benefit the ummah. Right? So that was his, um, Abu Abbas and Mursi's, uh, you know, connection with Abu Hassan al-Shadi. There's so many stories. I, you know, I, I cut a lot. I, I, I was going to bring a lot, but I, I, uh, you know, was scared of the time. So Abu Hassan al-Shadi, he used to go on Hajj every single year, and he, <clears throat> um, he was preparing for Hajj once, and as he was preparing, preparing Khidr, radiallahu anhu, came to him, and Khidr told him, he said, Allah has blessed you and accompanied you with a beautiful lutf, a beautiful ease and gentleness. And Allah is your companion, right, in, in your residence and in your departure, i.e. in wherever you stay and in your departure. And this was like, it was uh, indicative of the fact that he was preparing to go on a journey. Right? He was preparing to go on Hajj. Abu Hassan al-Shali understood this as, I'm going to, pass, I'm going to die soon. I, Allah SWT has told me now, that I'm going to, to leave this world soon, right? He's going to accompany, accompany me out of this world. So he told one of his students, he said, prepare the kefin and the, the perfume and the water, right? Prepare it for our travel. And the Muri's like, why? You know, he said, we'll see. And on that travel, on that trip towards Hajj, along the Red Sea in one of the, the ports, uh, Abu Hassan al-Shadi radiallahu anhu passed away. Um, and he said that he just went, he laid down and took a nap and he, and, and he, and he, and, um, and he used to also say, you know, don't wake me up from my nap. Because he, he called it the wird and gnome, right? The litany of sleep. Is that for the awliya, their sleep is a connection. We know that whenever we sleep, our souls, right? If we, uh, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises them up to the throne and they do and they make prostration in front of the throne. So the awliya, they experience this, right? They actually witness this elevation. So he said, don't wake me up from the litany, the wird of sleep. 
And um, may Allah bless us um, to, to draw closer to these awliya, to have a good opinion of them, right? to learn more about them, to make, and the point of this talk is to gain a connection with the awliya. Now, now all of us, alhamdulillah, we have a basic understanding of the awliya, and we use this now to hold that good opinion, right? to ask Allah to raise us to their ranks, to connect us to them, and then to continually maintain that relationship with knowing and loving the awliya for the rest of our lives. It's something that will protect us on the next day is the love of the awliya. Abu Hassan al-Shadili, he, used, he had many awrad and litanies that he wrote. And he said that you know, his longest one, which was uh, Hizbul Bar, this litany he wrote, uh, he said completely in kashf, which means he, didn't, he wasn't even uh, you know, awake when he wrote it. It was purely an opening from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I just want to read it just for the barakah. Uh, you know, the translation will be a little long. I want to just read a part of it, a very uh, short part of it, inshallah, just for the barakah. And then I'm going to, I'll try my best. If there's anyone else here who can um, sing some nasheeds, uh, please help me. But um, I'm going to first do the, the I'm going to first do the, the word of uh, Abu Hassan al Shadili, and then we'll do some awrad, uh, we'll do some quick nasheeds that I prepared um, uh, that were written by the awliya, right? So written by Abu Madi al Ghoth, written by, or Buzidi, sorry, and then written by Abdul Ghani al Nabulsi. This is just some of the awliya who wrote these nasheeds, and it was a tradition that the awliya would draw, you, they, would, they would draw closer to Allah through these nasheeds, right? Because they bring a ruhani, a spirit, right, around us, and it's uh, that spirit that allows us to continue to uh, draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So I'm just going to read some of his Hizbul Bar. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم فاطر السماوات والأرض عالم الغيب والشهادة أنت تحكم بين عبادك فهنيئا لمن عرفك فرضي بقضائك والويل لمن لم يعرفك بل الويل ثم الويل لمن أقر بوحدانيتك ولم يرضى بأحكامك اللهم إن القوم قد حكمت عليهم بالذل حتى عزوا وحكمت عليهم بالفقد حتى وجدوا فكل عز يمنع دونك فنسألك بدله ذلا تصحبه لطائف رحمتك وكل وجه يحجب عنك فنسألك عوضه فقطا تصحبه أنوار محبتك فإنه قد ظهرت السعادة على من أحببته وظهرت الشقاوة على من غيرك ملك فهب لنا من مواهب السعداء وعصمنا من موارد الأشقياء اللهم إنا قد عجزنا عن دفع الضر عن أنفسنا من حيث نعلم بما نعلم فكيف لا نعجز عن ذلك من حيث لا نعلم بما لا نعلم وقد أمرتنا ونهيتنا والمدح والذم ألزمتنا فأخو الصلاح من أصلحته وأخو الفساد من أضللته والسعيد حقا من أغنيت عن السؤال منك والشقي حقا من حرمته أحرمته مع كثرة السؤال لك فأغننا بفضلك عن سؤالنا منك ولا تحرمنا من رحمتك مع كثرة سؤالنا لك إنك على كل شيء قدير آمين سي آمين الحمد لله so that was one of his you know tremendously beautiful if you ever have the chance, you know, it's recommended to read this every week. If you ever have the chance to read it, that would be amazing. It's quite long. There's also a YouTube video uh, recording of it. You can play it. Tremendous barakah and, 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 and tawfiq and openings from reading that, inshallah. Um, so I think we'll do uh, quick questions. And then we'll do a little bit of nashis at the very end. All right, those watching at home, you can just type in the chat box and we'll monitor your questions. Inshallah, just raise your hand. Go to the sisters first if you'd like to, and then we'll go to the brothers. Just raise your hand, I'll come over with the mic. I know you had a question. Um, you're a female Sahaba story. I, um, you had a story about the female Sahaba, about the thief. Do you know her name? The thief. Uh, so 
I'm not, it wasn't a Sahabia that, with the thief um, who, who on her grave. Um, I don't know her name. It wasn't mentioned. But uh, the, the one who, the thief who came in and didn't find anything, that was Rabi al Adawiya. Uh, fame, good name to know. Rabi al Adawiya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for teaching us about the awliya. Thank you. Um, so there is a different form of awliya, is that right? Because you were saying that we can, it's, it's simple, but ordinary people can be awliya. Absolutely. So, so, I, so far I knew that awliya means, yeah, who is very much in Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lineage and who does a lot of jikis and, yes. you know, who is seculated himself to, you know, to Absolutely. Jiki, those are awliya, but awliya can be anybody. It can be That's anyone. It doesn't have to be even related to the Prophet Sallallahu And the signs are just that they have tremendous adab, that their act, that their good deeds outweigh their 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 bad deeds, and that they affect you when you're around them. You get better being around them. And sometimes awliya don't even know that they're awliya. That's the reality as well. Right? They said that the only wali that has to know is the one who then guides people as a wali, like as someone who's a spiritual sheikh. He has to know that he's reached a certain level to, to teach people, right? But there might be some of us, may Allah make us all from the awliya, who are awliya, and um, I'm benefiting from being in your presence. Thank you. And so Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was our master of all the awliya, right? Absolutely. Sometimes I get confused. They he's, have so much power, but then again, you know, we cannot just make them him, them to be similar like Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he's the master. is the absolute master of every single creation. They said that Ibn Abi, Ibn Abi Sheikh Al-Akbar, right? the, they said the greatest Sheikh, right? He said that he was given an understanding of his relation to the Prophet. He said that I, did, I wasn't more than a hair on the Prophet's body. I, in terms of his relation to what Allah has given the Prophet, he wasn't a hair on his body, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet is, is our number one, right? Of course. On the brother's side, is there, are there any questions? Yes, I'm coming right over to you, brother. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Oh, Thank right, you so much. It was, it was very nice. Uh, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm uh, originally from Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And especially in South Asia, uh, you have some really famous Aliyah that have, that have lived for many, many years. And mm -hmm. they have their, um, you know, um, the Muslims and people go there and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and I, um, I remember hearing a lot of stories from my father as well. He may, may Allah uh, grant him a place in Jannah. He passed away a few years ago. I mean, I mean. And he, he used to know a couple of them as well. Sure. So I, I was lucky enough when I was young to meet 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 so them. Much. One thing that uh, he used to tell me stories, and you know, in my youthful days, I. I hardly ever believe them because they, they sounded very supernatural. Mm -hmm. um, so I would love to hear some of those, if, if you don't mind, because you 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 went through a few uh, narrations of, you know, uh, some Aliyah, uh, but they were more about uh, them praying at night or being awake at night or knowing the what's in somebody else's heart. Mm -hmm. Would love to hear some of the sort of the Unbelievable supernatural stories as well, if 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 you don't mind. Mashallah. We, we we know of you know Rumi and and his sheikh. Uh, that's a very well known story that he came through the box in the river and then came, brought out. But that that's pretty much it. So would love if if you could share a few that that would be great. Thank you. So yeah, alhamdulillah, that's an amazing question. Actually, I I chose to uh, focus on that practical connection so that it wasn't just all uh, and it also would take up so much time but absolutely there's a majority there's a books Jamar Karamat al Awliya written by Imam Nabhani it's two volumes full of just Karamat right this person you know would walk on water well known that he would walk on water this person would you know would um, you know touch fire and so there's one one Awliya one Wali I'm forgetting his name but he was um uh, you know, uh, persecuted, and they threw him in fire. Right? They threw him in, in a fire, like even like uh, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, and nothing burned except for a fingernail. And they said, he said, 
that he said that fingernail I missed in my wudu earlier. All right. So one thing that's important is that all of the karamat al awliya are connected to the karamat of the anbiya. So every and this is actually there are classes of two awliya that and and a specific prophet that they take from. So they will have a little live a life and they'll have miracles that reflect the life and the openings of one specific prophet. Right? And this is what Ibn Arabi really brings, like right? is depending on the prophet, depending on the openings. So we'll see that most of the openings that we the, the karamat that we see for the prophets, we also see it in the um the awliya as well. Right. And this is like, you know, the, you know many stories of, you know, in other, in faraway lands, you know, one of the awliya he was once seen um, in a room, a small room, and there was multiple heaters blasting. This was in, in Syria. It was hot, right? And it was blasting. And then they brought him an entire tray as big as his table, right? And they gave it to, they gave it to him to eat, and he ate the entire thing, right? And he said that there are fuqara, right? And this is like witnessed. Everyone saw him. It was like, how did this like, small man eat all this food? He said that I have been giving, I have been in charge of spreading out Sustenance, right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al razaq. I've been given charge by Allah to spread out sustenance and warmth to those who are cold and don't have food. Right? So there are many stories of Aliyah and, and, and the Karamat. And I you know it'd be great. We could do a whole a whole three hour thing on just the, a billion different karamat. But amazing question, mashallah. Um Jazakallah khair. Yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. for uh, the lecture. Thank you. Uh, I would like to just uh, you know mention the, the awliya Allah salihin is not the prophets. Okay, the prophets are prophets because the sister there was asking about is the prophet peace be upon him is part of the anbiya? No awliya? No, he's not because the level of anbiya is different. The level of awliya, awliya Allah salihin is the one gonna go without judgment to the heaven uh -huh. there is 10 of them this they are the awliya and if we would like to be awliya we have to do exactly like you describe to be adab akhlaq of course. Of course. this is if you can be with adab and akhlaq you will be with awliya yeah. but we cannot mention because i'm afraid of this young age to take the, the prophets awliya no the prophets are not awliya it's higher the uh, absolutely. The prophets, the prophets have a rank that no one will ever reach. That's what they said. That Khudna biharan waqafat al anbiya ala sahiriha. We've entered into, into an ocean that the prophets are at the other side. Uh, you'll never reach the shore. So there's absolutely the the, the level of prophecy of nubuwa is not attainable. No matter how long we tried or how many effort we put in, it's not attainable. The Prophet is khatim and nabiyin. He's the final prophet. You know, no one will ever be a prophet after the Prophet them, and no one will ever be, a, and no one who is a wali who is not chosen to be a prophet is a prophet. Um, but they have the openings, right? That then the uliyah take from, right? So in a sense, it's like a, a bigger circle, right? All prophets are uliyah, but not all uliyah are prophets. It doesn't go both ways, right? So that's kind of jazakallah um, khair. Um, in the beginning, you talked about the jal and the confusion that is going to be during that time. Mm -hmm. But some of it is already happening, mm -hmm. and I wonder how can we differentiate between what is what the karamat are or false miracles? Yeah, so this is um, you know important, especially when you have a lot of you know um, you could say fake olia or people who claim things, right? Um, the idea is that we're not we're not looking at miracles as the only factor to to, to, to differentiate someone. Right? We look at at first their akhlaq, their their connection, to, their following of the prophetic sunnah, and that their good actions outweigh their bad their, their bad actions, and that they their aqidah and the fundamentals are all are all sound. Right? So everything has to be sound from the fundamentals, aqidah and fiqh and everything and normal religious practice before they even talk about openings, right? They said, so whoever, Imam Malik used to say, whoever does um, fiqh and doesn't do tasawwufai, the spirituality, right, ends up becoming a, a, a fasiq, 
right? He ends up just you know not uh, you know not going the right way. And whoever woman uh, and whoever does tasawwuf and doesn't tafaqaha, right? They've left Islam, right? So just spirituality without fiqh and rules is not Islam. And then the jajal is someone who will his his miracles will be very clear, right? So he's a person that will come and the fitna will be made very apparent. When that comes, may Allah protect us from that time and not let us reach that time. We don't want to be uh, alive when that time comes. But he will be, it will be very clear that he's a Jajjal uh, when, when, when he does perform those miracles. And may Allah protect us from those, from those miracles, uh, from, from him. Yeah, I mean. Sorry, I don't want to take all the oxygen in the room. But uh, I have two questions actually okay, very okay. quick. So the first one is that you you mentioned that Aliyah are in every city and they are they are a protection for that city. Absolutely. Um, so what's happening in Gaza? And I'm sure there's a land of Aliyah. Mm -hmm. So why is that not being protected? That's number one. That's a pretty serious question. But the second one would love to hear your story, right? I mean, how did you get to this path? If you walk us through it and just tell a little little bit about yourself as well, we would appreciate it very much. Thanks. So JazakAllah Astaghfirullah. My, my name shouldn't be mentioned with their names, but with regards to uh, Gaza, may Allah protect and, and give victory to our, our, our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Um, the, the best protection is a protection of Iman. The greatest protection is our religion. Right, so the as we see from the Palestinians, their connection and tawakkul and, and and hope in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is higher than anything we've seen. It's actually the biggest reason why we see so many people converting is because they see the belief of the people of Palestine. So the protection is fundamentally our greatest blessing that we have is not our lives, it's our belief in Allah, and that's the the number one protection. And then secondly, when it comes to outward tribulations. The most tried people are prophets and then those who are uh, closest in rank and closest in similarity. So in reality, in, when it comes to uh, tribulations, there are two, uh, it is one of two. It's either a purification of sins or an increase in ranks. Allah SWT says that some, Allah, he, he will try, Rada Salihin, he says he will try his slave, his servant, until he meets him with no sins. So we absolutely, you know, we don't want what's happening. We ask Allah for afiyah, for protection for the Muslims, that, that he defeat the enemies of Islam, and he remove the oppressors from the land. But any tribulation that they go is a purification and a raise in ranks. And it, is, it might be that their tribulation is because they are special people, right? because they are the closest to the prophetic way. Right? And they're in a very blessed Mubarak land, right? So, but the but the protection of the Oliya fun, uh, fundamentally is iman. That's the number one protection that they that they bring. And the second uh, I, I I traveled when I was fourteen Mauritania. I studied there for two years, and then I went to Jordan for five years, Turkey. Um, and I've just I've been blessed to study with some of the you know shiuch and those who have studied and learned from them and benefited from them. Um, so that's that's basically where I, you know where I'm just pulling from 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 what they've taught me. None of it's my own my own understanding. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So inshallah, we'll, I think we've yeah. Okay. Take so we'll just question. do a quick um, nasheeds before maghrib. Dean and Ayman. Just do a quick, quick, quick. I'm not a, I'm not a singer, but I'll try my best. These are the professional drummers right here, the other Lucy boys. May Allah preserve them. Okay. Allah. So I'm going to read, I'm going to do one by uh, Buzidi. This one's a bit slower. And the course is just La ilaha illallah, Muhammad al Rasul. And then I'll do uh, a couple others by the Salihin. <clears throat> so, no. 
ما لذات العيش إلا صحبات الفقراء هم السلاطين والسادات والأمراء لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله عليه صلاة الله فاصحبه وتأدي دم في مجالسهم وخلي حظك مهما خلفوك ورا لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله عليه صلاة الله واستغني من الوقت واحضر دائما معهم واعلم بأن الرضا يختص من حضر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله عليه صلاة الله ولازم الصمت إن سئلت إلا فقل لا علم عندي وكم بالجهل أهلي مستترا لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله عليه صلاة الله ولا ترى الغيب إلا فيك معتقدا عيبا بدا بينا لكنه استترى لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله عليه صلاة الله قوم كرام السجايا حيث ما نزلوا يبقى المكان على آثار ريهم عطيرة أحبهم وأداريهم وأدرهم بمهجتي وخصوصا منهم نفر أحبهم وأداريهم وأدرهم بمهجتي وخصوصا منهم نفر الله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى اله I'm just going to get the next one up <coughs> Allah Allah Allah. Just one second. Okay. Bismillah. كن الله ترى الله معك واترك الكل وحذر طمعك لا إله إلا الله 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 والصلاة على مولاي رسول الله ثم ضع نفسك بالذل له قبل أن النفس قهرا وضعك إنما أنت له عبد فكون جاعلا في القرب منه ولا عاك لا إله 
فقصد حماه أهل الوفاهم لمن وفاهم إن رمت تحيا فقصد حماه يا آل بيت النبي طيب العربي فيكم دعوت ربي لتفرج كربي يا آل بيت النبي الطيب العربي فيكم دعوت ربي لتفرج كربي مولاي صل وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم مولاي صل وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم آمن تذكر جيرا بذي سلام ماذا اجتدى مع جرى من مقلاة بتم أم هبت الريح من تلقائك ظمة وأو مضى البرق في الظلمان من إضام فما لعينيك إن قلت كفوفا هامتا وما لقلبك إن قلت استفق يا هيمي أيحسب الصب أن الحب 
قدامون كاتيمون ما بين مون ساجيم من هو مطري مي لولا الهوى لم تورق دمعا على طلال ولا أريق تاني ذكر الباني والعالم مولا يا صلي وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم وأثبت الوجد خطي عبرات وضانا مثل البهاري على خديك والعنام نعم سرى الطيف من أهوى فأرقاني والحب يعترض اللذات بالألم يا لئيمي في الهوى العذري مع ذيرة مني إليك ولو أنصفت لم تلومي عادتك حاني يا لا سري بمستتير عن الوشاة ولا دائي بمنحسم ما حط طان النصح لكن لست أسمعه إن المحب عن العذال في صمم إن اتهمت نصيح الشيب في عذلي والشيب أبعد في نصح عن تهم مولا يا صلي وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله Jazakallah khair for coming out. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. I had a wonderful time. Jazakallah khair, Sidi. May Allah bless you for making time for this community. Um, a quick reminder, we're a minute away from pushing into Maghrib, inshallah. But really quickly, we mentioned that for our boys 12 to 19, I believe, we have grappling with Sidi Muhammad uh, this Sunday from 10.30 to 5. Yeah. So please register if, uh, for the boys, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Thanks for joining us. Assalamu alaikum.